The Tom Woods Show, episode 1670. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, by now you've probably noticed that news about the virus is almost always fact-free hysteria these days. So you need my brand new free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About the Lockdown. Go pick it up at wrongaboutlockdown.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Before we get to our very important guest today, I'd like to let you all know that, believe it or not, in the coming days, there is yet another free Tom Woods ebook forthcoming. And this one is going to be on the police and the problems with the police. That's a topic that's obviously in the news, and we want to make sure that there's a libertarian voice out there talking about it. And one of the benefits of having been around the libertarian movement for so long and knowing everybody and being friends with everybody, I mean, I've spoken at uh, the the LP National Convention and, and countless state conventions and uh, lectured all over the world and had the good fortune of meeting and becoming a good friends with so many very, very impressive people is that my show has become a kind of who's who of the libertarian world. It's been a, a really, really wonderful experience hosting this program and to be able to have an archive of material as strong as the Tom Woods Show archive is. And I'm able to draw on that for the forthcoming ebook. So, for example, Will Grigg, we all know, was the best. He left us much too soon. He was the best libertarian voice on police abuse. I mean, you know that and I know that. And he'll be featured in it. Bruce Benson, the great academic at Florida State University, who's done top-notch work on the police, will be featured in it. The great Dale Brown from the Detroit Threat Management Center is an outstanding individual, has done terrific work in nonviolent conflict resolution. So there's going to be a lot of great material in this ebook. So keep your ears peeled. I will be announcing it on the program in the coming days. So make sure if you're not a subscriber to the Tom Woods Show, you do that. You rectify that right away over at tomwoods.com slash Apple, where you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts for free, of course. Well, today we're talking to Spike Cohen. We've already talked to Dr. Joe Jorgensen, who is the Libertarian Party's presidential nominee for 2020. And today we're talking to the vice presidential nominee, Spike Cohen. And rather than doing what I normally do, which is to give you the guest's background, I think it would be more interesting to get the background from the horse's mouth. So, uh, Spike, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me, Tom. I have had a lot of requests to have you on. I've had a lot of people tell me what an interesting fellow you are. And let's just say uh, a lot of people who like and dislike you find you to be rather an interesting fellow. So let's see if we can clear the air on some of this. Uh, First of all, what's your background? Not ideologically, but just where you're from, what you've done for a living, stuff like that. Sure, absolutely. So I am from the Myrtle Beach area, and uh, I started a web design company back in my teens uh, in 1999. And I grew that into a fairly successful company. And then in 2016, I was diagnosed with MS and decided that I wanted to actually focus my life on something that was more important than just you know growing a business and making money. So I decided to uh, retire from web design and focus my life on my real passion, which was spreading the message of liberty to a public that often hasn't heard of ideas like self-ownership and non-aggression and voluntary solutions and so forth. And so that culminated in my becoming the co-owner of Money Waters Media, the host of My Fellow Americans, and the co-host of the Money Waters Freedom. And uh, last uh, December, I decided to seek the Libertarian Party nomination for vice president. And for the last six months, I have, or I guess just over six months now, I have been going around the country back before everything shut down and was spreading the message of liberty, going to Republican and Democrat events, poaching their supporters, going to college campuses, knocking on doors and housing projects and marginalized communities to spread the message of liberty. And apparently on the strength of what I've done, the uh, Libertarian Party delegates saw fit to make me their, their nominee for vice president. Wow, that was fantastic. <laughs> that right there, that was, that was just great. Now, incidentally, of course, being involved in web design, which is probably the least of those accomplishments, as great as it is to have a successful business in your teens, but mm-hmm. it shows a, a particular alertness to be doing web design in the 1990s. You know, when you still had people like Paul Krugman saying that when all said and done, we'll probably <laughs> see that the internet will the have had no greater machine, impact yeah, than the fax yeah. machine. Right? Yep, yep, the fax machine quote. It was funny because by the time he was saying that, I was already fairly successful in web design. And I thought, you know, I'm thinking he might be missing the mark on the whole fax machine thing. 
that was my one of my first times of realizing that you really shouldn't listen to much of anything that Paul Krugman says. So yeah, no, I when I did my design, it's kind of a libertarian story. When I was in my teens, having spent a couple summers working before that and realizing I didn't want to work for anyone else, uh, and also kind of looking at this idea of going to school for four to eight years and running up tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt as a bit of a scam, I decided that I wanted to get involved in something that was disruptive, that was new to the market. And, and web design at that point, especially for small businesses, was absolutely disruptive. That was something I could basically learn on my own and something that didn't require me to get any additional licensing or you know, college degree or anything else other than obviously just a, you know, a, a state business license. And so uh, that's what I went into. And web design was sort of that fit for me. And it paid off pretty well. I mean, I, I'm not a billionaire or anything like that, but I was able to, to grow it from essentially, you know, just me with my laptop into a, a fairly successful company and has afforded me the ability now to be able to focus my life full time on spreading the liberty message. Well, that's just tremendous. So how did you first come into contact with libertarian ideas? Everybody has some kind of a story, juicy or otherwise, about this. I'm not sure my story, well, I guess it's juicy, but I, I will say this. I actually started as a neocon and I had some pretty-, pretty You and me both, my friend. <laughs> and I had the kind of the standard issue, very bad bigoted views that often come with being a neocon. And you know, I was that stereotypical young 20 something, young Republican, had my own company, thought I knew everything and had some really, really, really bad ideas as a result of that. Uh, I knew better than anyone else. And of course, as a libertarian, I, I definitely don't think that now. But so I, you know, during that time, I sort of kind of got slowly disabused of my notions, not just on being a neocon, but just on some of the bigoted beliefs I had in general. And uh, the events in Iraq and Afghanistan, and then hearing what Ron Paul said, which I hated at first, but then hearing what he said about blowback and what if China were doing this to us, over time really started to hit home. And uh, I kind of moved my way from being, you know, a neocon into being something more of a, I guess, constitutionalist, Republican conservative into then being something more of a, I guess, minarchist, uh, classical liberal type to where I am now, which is just a straight up anarchist. And, uh, you know, going into the Libertarian Party and kind of being exposed to the prevailing culture there really helped open my eyes, not just to some of the bad political ideas I had, but just some of the bad social ideas I had in general. And it's been a, something I'm very grateful for. One of the things that pleased and impressed me about how Ron Paul handled that was that it was daring enough for people in the Republican Party to say, we shouldn't be in these wars because we're putting our troops in harm's way for no good reason. I mean, okay, that's right. better than nothing. But Ron Paul was willing to say, you know, there are innocent people, innocent civilians who are dying. And yes, I know they don't look like you and they don't speak your language, but they're human beings too. And it was astonishing to me that he's practically the only person talking that way. We, we, we are all human beings on some level. It was crazy because, and I, equally crazy was that when I heard those ideas, I was outraged at first. I mean, they, you know, I will say I was, tr I was one of the, you know, triggered neocons that would get very upset when I would hear this man, like you just said, basically say, these people have lives too. They have communities too. We are wrecking their lives for something that really doesn't even benefit us either. It benefits a, a very small, powerful handful of people and, and the cronies that surround them. It's not benefiting us. It sure as hell isn't benefiting the people that are loved ones that we're sending over there to fight and come back with PTSD and a traumatic brain injury and you know injuries and just you know bad memories from all of it. And it's certainly not helping the people over there whose you know entire neighborhoods and communities and, and countries are being destroyed and destabilized in the process. But hearing that initially was a very, you know, I had no logical rebuttal to it. I only had the, you know, the, the emotional rebuttal of, oh, you just hate America. And it took time to realize, no, the people that are doing this to us are the ones who either hate America or are so cynically ambivalent to the future of this country and definitely the future of those countries that they would allow these things or, or push for these things to happen for their own benefit and power. Suppose at the very last minute you get an invitation to speak before a mixed audience of, of folks. So some of them agree with you. Some are just curious. Suppose Joe is suddenly ill and you've got to step in at the last minute. You don't have time to prepare anything. And they just say, oh, just give your stump speech. What would be covered in that kind of speech? Obviously, that would depend on how much time I had. If I, if I had enough time, I'd delve into ideas of self-ownership and, and non-aggression and things like that. I would say that, you know, 
we own ourselves, we own our lives, we own our bodies, we own our labor, we own our property, which is the product of our labor, and that any act against that is, a, is an act of aggression. And not only is it morally wrong because you shouldn't you know, harm people, you shouldn't take their things without their, their consent, but it also doesn't work because if I can simply take from you and everyone else who's listening at any time that I see fit, I'm not going to be a good steward of what I have because I can simply take from you and everyone else as I see fit. And you and the people listening might not be good stewards of what you have because you know I can take from you at any time that I see fit. And what is government and its bad, centrally planned, arbitrary, cronious decisions, but a situation in which a authority has claimed you know, the right and the authority to take from all of us as they see fit. And that's why bad government ideas don't work because they are an act of aggression and that aggression is going to lead to the harmful, abusive, and inequitable outcomes that we see for all of us and especially of marginalized communities, racial minorities, people of color, gender and sexual minorities, religious and ethnic minorities, the poor, the homeless, immigrants, but really all of us. Uh, it's going to lead to that precisely because acts of aggression don't lead to good stewardship. Now, if I only had a couple minutes to say it, I would give the shorter version of that, which is that Republicans and Democrats have been in control for over 150 years, almost exclusively, not just at the federal level, but at the local level. They have created this system. And any of them who are saying that they're suddenly going to, in this cycle of all other, you know, not every other cycle before, but finally in this cycle, you know, they need your vote so that they can make the changes that we need to see. I think that that's obviously a shell game. It's an obvious sham and has been for several decades or at least a, you know, a century now. And that those people who and those organizations that brought you these terrible government centered, centrally planned bad decisions are never going to give you good ones. They're never going to give you good solutions because they created the problem and they benefit from the problem at your expense. And you're only going to get good options from people who are not enmeshed in that system. And libertarians are the only ones offering a good alternative to what the Republicans and Democrats have given you. I've sometimes thought that over the past 20 years, I could narrow down the number of real fiascos in America to three. The Iraq War, the financial crisis of 2008 and the policies that led to it, and now the lockdown policies of, of 2020, that I think all of these were founded in bad ideas from the get-go. And they are more or less bipartisan. Now, this lockdown thing was less so, but there, there are Republican governors everywhere who went along with it, and Trump more or less bought into it. And each one of these, we were told all the experts support it, there's no problem. I didn't hear anybody complaining about the Federal Reserve in the years leading up to the, the crisis. So these people have yielded you fiasco and catastrophe one after the other. And if you keep electing them, it's just going to be more fiascos and catastrophes. <laughs> They're not well, as different as they want you to think they are. And if you look historically, I mean, we can look at all th those are our three good examples. You also have the internment of Japanese for no good reason, because ultimately they would rather just lock everyone up in that situation than to look at them individually. Uh, the rampant police brutality that we have, the rampant homeless situation we have, the camps that we have along the border, these are all situations where a combination of fear and ambivalence to the suffering and the plight of the individuals that are involved in that. Because we as libertarians believe that the individual, it's the, the old Ayn Rand quote, that the individual is the smallest minority. And if you look at all of these abuses that happen by the state, it is situations in which the state is not looking at us as individuals, as the smallest minority. They're grouping us into groups. They're deciding which groups are you know, politically expedient to deal with as they wish. They you know, put together as much fear as they can within the populace to push forward these terrible ideas. And then, of course, the cronies line up to benefit in whatever way they can. That's how we ended up with the war on drugs. That's how we ended up with the war on sex work. That's how we ended up with these endless wars overseas. That's how we ended up with the lockdowns and everything else. You'll notice that during the lockdowns, they weren't telling you you can't go to Walmart or Target or buy stuff on Amazon. They were telling you not to go to the small furniture store or to go to, you know, the small business that wasn't able to lobby to get themselves labeled in a quote unquote essential business. Every single example is a time where government looks at politically expedient populations that they can scapegoat to the detriment of those groups and really to all of us and to the benefit of whatever favored cronies are paying their bills to get them elected in the first place because they're not the ones writing these laws. It's the cronies that are doing it. And this all goes back to the Federal Reserve and a lot of people don't realize that. But here's the thing, Tom, 
The American people would never agree to have their taxes increased to pay for these wars and the war on drugs and the endless caging of innocent people for victimless crimes and victimless commerce. They would have never agreed to that. But if the Federal Reserve prints out endless trillions of dollars that they lend to themselves or lend to the federal government at you know, rock bottom interest rates, that's a harder thing to sell as an outrage. It's, it's harder to try to explain that because there's multiple steps. And yet, how much more insidious is that system? Not only are we now having to pay off those debts with the interest, but in, in printing that additional money out without creating any uh, you know, correlating increase in value, they're diminishing the value of all of the dollars that they force us to use with their monopoly on the issuance of currency, which is why one of our platforms is auditing the Fed ending the Fed, and then replacing it with free market banking, where competing entities will compete to give us the most sound versions of currency that will actually potentially gain in value over time, or at the very least maintain their value over time because they want our business, as opposed to a monopoly imposing their currency on us for no other reason than to be able to uh, use that currency for their own political hobby horses and whatever else they're pushing. All right. You've got a, an important message that people need to hear, but you unfortunately, are in a very strange situation. You have to campaign in the waning weeks of a pandemic. What does that look like? So I actually consider this to be the great equalizer for us, right? Because usually the Republicans and Democrats can fill up stadiums with AstroTurf. That's they a good can, point. They can, they can present if you look, you see, you're used to seeing Donald Trump and Joe Biden, and they're in a stadium filled with a bunch of AstroTurf, dozens or hundreds of people behind them. And what people are seeing when they're being programmed by media, what they're seeing is, look at all these people be literally behind Joe Biden, literally behind Donald Trump. Look at them with their MAGA hats and their, and their Biden stickers and sweaters or whatever. Look at them with all their stuff and supporting this politician why aren't you supporting them? Why aren't you, you know, on the Biden train or the Trump train? Now we're all just a bunch of schmucks in front of our webcams. And the difference is those schmucks are in front of their webcams explaining how they're somehow the solution to the problems that they created. I love watching Joe Biden talk about how we need to demilitarize oh, the police. He's one of the I people know. who co-wrote the 1033 plan. And Donald Trump, who will say, you know, he's going to bring the country together when he's one of the main people trying to pour gasoline on the fire that exists right now. These are the people who are going to bring us out of this. And, and we are in front of our webcams and on our phones saying just the opposite, that they created these problems. They're the ones who benefit from making them worse and keeping them bad and creating new problems because they've created a system whereby they benefit from our suffering. And we as libertarians want to dismantle that system so that we can all live freer and safer and healthier lives and our children can have better futures. I think because you've been so well-spoken and people have gotten to know you, some of the initial criticisms that you were getting have become a bit muted. But all the same, I still see them circulating here and there. They say uh, Spike Cohen is not a serious candidate and he does right. goofy things and he's going to damage the brand. How do you respond to that? So I think some of this came from the fact that during the – I guess we can't call it the primary because we don't have primaries, but during the Libertarian Party nomination process, I was running alongside Vermin Supreme. And so a lot of people who don't necessarily get Vermin shtick are kind of thinking that, you know, Vermin was a joke and by extension, therefore, I'm a joke. Well, first of all, let me address one thing. I have always campaign seriously. Even as Vermin's running me, and even at times that I engaged in some satirical stuff with him, I was always the quote unquote serious one. And my plan has always been, whether I was paired with Vermin or Joe or, or Jacob, someone who I knocked on doors with in housing projects in Wilmington, North Carolina, whether I was paired with whomever, whomever that the libertarians picked, I was always going to be someone who was, you know, almost 100% of the time campaigning just as seriously as anyone else would. But I want to go double back on the, on the satire angle and the Vermin angle. Vermin Supreme is a well-respected political satirist who is beloved by millions. And the reason that he was so successful, that we were so successful in bringing so many people into the Libertarian Party in such a short period of time is because at times, when appropriate, we engaged in what we call nonlinear messaging, something he's perfected over many, many years, actually over decades. And what nonlinear messaging is, we recognize that something like 40% of eligible voters do not vote. And the reason they don't vote, whenever there's any studies or, or uh, surveys or anything where they focus groups, where they ask them why they don't vote, we hear the same thing over and over from them. 
The government doesn't care. The government is just lying to us. All politicians lie. I don't want to hear anything of what any of them have to say. And, you know, the government just has it out for us. We will never benefit from the system. We are the victims of the system. And so I don't even want to participate. Those are pretty libertarian ideas for not participating in the system. And if we could reach them, then it would be a pretty easy sell for them to understand that we're not like the others and that we are trying to change the system and dismantle the things that make what they're saying true. The problem is they don't want to hear anything from any politician. If I show up and go, I'm Spike Cohen and I'm here with the Libertarian Party and I'd like to talk to you about self-ownership, they've already tuned me out. They are either bored by me or they are disgusted by me because I'm yet another politician. But if we're entertaining them, then we get their attention. Now they're enjoying it. Now they aren't being lied to by a politician or pandered to by a politician. They're just being entertained. And not only have we now gotten their attention, but their cognitive defenses are lowered. They're not putting their, their cognitive dukes up waiting to hear something that challenges them. They're just having a good time. And they hear that there's an underlying political message there, but they're just having a good time. And over time, as those defenses go down, as we, you know, as we demonstrate ourselves as someone that they want to actually listen to, now they actually are interested in what that underlying political message is. They want to know more. What is this actually about? Why are you two doing this? And then we would hit them with the message. And it was incredibly successful. Back in April, the Libertarian Party had a presidential recruitment competition where every single presidential candidate team uh, was given their own code and, and encouraged to invite people to use the code to join the party. We got nearly twice as many people using that code to join the party as every other candidate combined. We called it boot pilling. And it's the, the, using the boots and the ponies and the satire and everything else to reach people who are unreachable by usual political messaging, by linear messaging, and bringing them in to a message that is innate and intuitive to them, which was why they weren't participating in the first place. Now, again, with that said, the vast majority of my campaigning has always been serious and will continue to remain serious. At times when satire and humor is appropriate, especially the whole meme culture on the internet, I will engage with it in appropriate ways in order to be able to bring people in. But this has always been a serious thing to me. Anyone who's followed my shows or my interviews or anything else, anyone who's listening to this, I think uh, can walk away understanding that I am serious about this. This is something that is very powerful to me. I want us to be dismantling these systems of infringement and oppression on us and on marginalized communities. I want to end these wars. I want to end the war on drugs. I want to end the war on the border. I want to end all of the infringements on our daily decisions in our lives that make our lives more difficult, make it harder for us to be able to interact with each other and be able to build a future for ourselves. I want to draw a very clear line in the sand. On the one side of that line, I want to put myself and Joe and those of us who want to remove the boot from the neck of the people so that they can move forward together and use spontaneous actions within the market to solve the problems that are often imposed upon them or made worse by government. And on the other side of that line, I want to put those who are the rest of them, the Republicans and the Democrats, who want to keep that boot on the neck of the people and allow continued unnecessary suffering for no other reason than to preserve their own power and wealth. I don't know how you can improve on that answer. I was very, very skeptical. I mean, I, I'm still not a vermin supreme guy, but I hear what you're saying. I hear that case uh, much more clearly now, and I understand it much more clearly than I did before. But I think, I think these are all more than reasonable answers. I have to ask you, though, the same question that I asked uh, Dr. Jorgensen, because it's the question that, unfortunately, every single interview you're going to have to deal with, and I just want to know how you've perfected it and approached it the old throwing your vote away question, right? I mean, if I vote for Trump, he might win. If I vote for Biden, he might win. You guys have such an uphill battle. Why should I vote for you? I think that we can safely say at this point, Tom, that Americans have been throwing their vote away for the better part of 150 years at least, probably even further back than that. If you look at the actions that have been undertaken by Democrats and Republicans, and we recognize that it doesn't matter which side wins. We're still going to get more of the same terrible things and the same terrible, abusive, inequitable, harmful outcomes that come every new cycle. I think we can at this point say that continuing to vote for something that has so obviously failed us to the benefit of a very small number of oligarchs and cronies, that would be the waste there. And this is also part of, you know, here, here's some inside baseball stuff for libertarians and why I don't believe that we need to moderate our message. Yes, we need to focus on what the benefit is because most people are not like us. You know, most people, all human beings process things with some combination of intuition, emotion, and intellect. 
And I think libertarians tend to be, and it's different from person to person and from subject to subject, but I think libertarians tend to systemize stuff. We tend to use a little bit less of the intuition than most and a little bit less of the emotion than most and more of the intellect. And so when we look at things, we tend to systemize things. Well, how does this work within the filter of my ethos and my philosophy and my praxis? That's not how most people think. Most people think, how is this going to benefit me and my loved ones and my community? And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just differences in how people process things. And I think we often, you know, I like to say libertarians are good at two things, winning arguments and losing elections. And I think that in order for us to change that pattern, we need to recognize that, you know, quote unquote normies, that most people look at things more intuitively. So yes, we need to tailor our message towards being empathetic and trustworthy people who demonstrate that we're listening to others and then show how our solutions will benefit people. But that's completely different from watering down our actual principles, because here's what happens when we give people a choice for a third party. A third party candidacy, a third party is largely an invitation to people to vote for a candidate and a party who statistically is very unlikely to win, right? Like we know that from the federal level, the state level, everything else, we are basically asking them to vote for an option that more often than not is probably not going to win. So if we present ourselves as, you know, somewhat better than the Republicans and Democrats. And, you know, we're the best of the Republicans and the best of the Democrats. What they're hearing is this. I can either vote Republican or Democrat, which isn't really that great. And they don't really represent me, but they're likely to win. Or I can vote for this new third party I just heard about that sounds like they are somewhat better, but they have almost no chance of winning. That's how you get 1%, 2%, 3%, maybe even 5%. That's not how you win. You win by disabusing them of the notion that any of the other options are even worth their vote at all. You disabuse them of the notion that there's any real difference between the Republicans and the Democrats, and you demonstrate to them using empathetic and engaging and dynamic messaging, demonstrating us as being people who are trustworthy and who are listening and who care that we are the only viable option so that they don't care if they're the only single person in this country that votes for us. They're going to vote for us because they don't see anyone else as a viable option. That is how we will turn it around. That is how our messaging is geared. We are no longer going to do the we're the Republicans who like weed thing or the we're the Democrats who like guns thing. We are libertarians. We are socially libertarian and we are fiscally libertarian. And we support an ethos that is based on benefit that comes from voluntary human action and people working in voluntary help with each other, as opposed to imposing some centrally planned statist authority that harms most to the benefit of a few. Oh, one last thing. I think the reason that people feel, one of the reasons these days in particular, that people feel compelled to vote for a Democrat or Republican is fear, is that there's so much division in the country that the Democrats fear that if Trump gets in office again, it's going to be open season on them. And likewise, if Biden gets in power, the Republicans fear reprisals against them. So I think it's not necessarily that I've looked over Joe Biden's platform and I like 12 of the 14 points. It's more, I don't dare do anything other than vote for Joe Biden because I can't imagine what the Republicans are going to have in store for me. How do we address that? Yeah, it's absolutely based on fear. I mean, if you listen to the vast majority, I call them uh, nose holders. So the vast majority of voters are holding their nose and voting for whichever side they see as less, you know, horrible and toxic than the other side. And so, and then that comes down to basically what kind of media they consume that tells them which side is worse. I like to say Republicans and Democrats are never more honest. Republican politicians and Democrat politicians are never more honest when they are criticizing and describing the other side. And the beauty of that hypocrisy is that it almost always equally describes them. But yes, it's absolutely based on fear. That's how you get people to sign up for wars. That's how you get people to be fine with wars. That's how you get people to be fine with all of these you know, economic burdens, these financial burdens and, and, and regulatory burdens that make it nearly impossible to work your way up the economic ladder if you're below a certain point. That's how you get people to sign up for literal camps on the border and violations of our right to host, hire, and house whomever we wish on our property and to travel to properties where we are welcome. That's how you end up with that is through fear. And so our messaging is largely going to be based on telling people your fear is what has gotten you here. Their imposition of fear on you is what has gotten us here. And I mean, there will be some messaging of, it's not a threat. It's just the reality that if you keep voting Republican and Democrat, you're going to keep getting more of every single thing that you hate. 
And the only way that we are going to get out of this, the only way that we are going to have a brighter and more hopeful future, the only way we're going to end the trend that we have right now, where both the millennial and Gen Z generations are projected to have a worse quality of life than their parents and grandparents did, something that hasn't been true in in American society for the hundred years they've been measuring such a thing, is by breaking away from the duopoly or the republicrats, as I like to call them, and moving towards people who have actual solutions to the problems that have been created or made worse by Democrats and Republicans. What's your campaign website? Our campaign website is joj2020.com. And uh, my social media is on Twitter at Real Spike Cohen and on Facebook at facebook.com slash literally Spike Cohen. Or if you just search for Spike Cohen, you'll find it. And if you search for Joe Jorgensen on any social media, you will find it. Joe and I are fighting for a future in which your education is uh, decided by you, the parent, and your children, and by the teacher instead of by cronies and politicians and bureaucrats in Washington. We're fighting for a future where your healthcare decisions are decided by you and your doctor instead of those same cronies, where the wars end and the healing can begin, where the war on drugs and the war on sex work ends, and the victims of those wars are set free from the cages that they've been put in for engaging in commerce, that politicians politicians didn't like, where you and your loved ones are freer and safer and happier and healthier, and where your children have a brighter future than we could have ever imagined. That is what Joe Jorgensen and I are fighting for. And with your help and your support, that is what we will do. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to link to all those things on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 1670. That's 1670. So the campaign website, the social media platforms, all that stuff will be linked there. Well, best of luck, Spike. We appreciate what you're doing and your time today. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. All right, folks, while you wait for the Tom Woods ebook on the police, you can tide yourself over with another one of my ebooks. Let me think, what would be a good one right now? Completely not topical at all. Uh, how about health care? Why not, right? Everybody thinks we want people to die because we don't favor state-run health care. That's actually not true, believe it or not. We don't want people to die. So I have a free ebook called Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Healthcare. You can go pick that up at yourfriendsarewrong.com. My favorite domain name of all time, Your Friends Are Wrong. So go check out yourfriendsarewrong.com and I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, wait, wait, let me tell you what's coming up tomorrow. The great Vijay Boyapati. You may remember him from the Ron Paul days in 2008. He worked at Google. I guess it was 2007 when he heard about Ron Paul and VJ decided he was gonna quit his job at Google and spend his time spreading the message of Ron Paul, of sound money, anti-war and all that stuff. And I have not spoken to VJ in about 10 years. And I don't know why I've never had him on the Tom Wood Show. We are rectifying that tomorrow with a Bitcoin episode. I'm going to try to do an episode that is not about police or the virus because that's all I've been talking about. And we do have other things in the world. So from time to time, we're going to have a non-virus episode. And that's what we've got tomorrow. So make sure you tune in for that. I'll see you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free. And we'll see you next time. Like the sound of the Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.